The Metamorphosis by Franz Kafka Chapter 1 When Gregor Samsa woke up one morning from unsettling dreams, he found himself changed in his bed into a monstrous vermin. He was lying on his back, as hard as armor plate, and when he lifted his head a little, he saw his vaulted brown belly sectioned by arch-shaped ribs, to whose dome the cover, about to slide off completely, could barely cling. His many legs, pitifully thin compared with the size of the rest of him, were waving helplessly before his eyes. What, what has happened to me? he thought. It was no dream. His room, a regular human room, only a little on the small side, lay quiet between the four familiar walls. Over the table on which an unpacked line of fabric samples was all spread out, Samsa was a traveling salesman, hung the picture which he had recently cut out of a glossy magazine and lodged in a pretty gilt frame. It showed a lady done up in a fur hat and fur boa, sitting upright and raising up against the viewer a heavy fur muff in which her whole forearm had disappeared. Gregor's eyes then turned to the window and the overcast weather. He could hear raindrops hitting against the metal window ledge. Completely depressed him. How about going back to sleep for a few minutes and forgetting all this nonsense, he thought. But that was completely impracticable, since he was used to sleeping on his right side and, in his present state, could not get into that position. No matter how hard he threw himself onto his right side, he always rocked onto his back again. He must have tried it a hundred times, closing his eyes so as not to have to see his squirming legs, and stopped only when he began to feel a slight, dull pain in his side, which he had never felt before. Oh, God, he thought, what a grueling job I've picked. Day in, day out, on the road, the upset of doing business is much worse than the actual business in the home office, and besides, I've got the torture of traveling, worrying about changing trains, eating miserable food at all hours, constantly seeing new faces, no relationships that last or get more intimate. To the devil with it all. He felt a slight itching up on top of his belly, shoved himself slowly on his back closer to the bedpost so as to be able to lift his head better, found the itchy spot studded with small white dots which he had no idea what to make of and wanted to touch the spot with one of his legs but immediately pulled it back for the contact sent a cold shiver through him. He slid back again into his original position. This getting up so early, he thought, makes anyone a complete idiot. Human beings have to have their sleep. Other traveling salesmen live like harem women. For instance, when I go back to the hotel before lunch to ride up the business I've done, these gentlemen are just having breakfast. That's all I'd have to try with my boss. I'd be fired on the spot. Anyway, who knows if that wouldn't be a very good thing for me. If I didn't hold back for my parents' sake, I would have quit long ago. I would have marched up to the boss and spoken my piece from the bottom of my heart. He would have fallen off the desk. It's funny, too, the way he sits on the desk and talks down from the heights to the employees, especially when they have to come right up close on account of the bosses being hard of hearing. Well, I haven't given up hope completely. Once I've gotten the money together to pay off my parents' debt to him, that will probably take another five or six years. I'm going to do it without fail. Then I'm going to make the big break. But for the time being, I'd better get up, since my train leaves at five. And he looked over at the alarm clock, which was ticking on the chest of drawers. God almighty, he thought. It was 6.30. The hands were quietly moving forward, and it was actually past the half hour. It was already nearly a quarter to. Could it be that the alarm hadn't gone off? He could see from the bed that it was set correctly for four o'clock. It certainly had gone off, too, yes. Uh, but was it possible to sleep quietly through a ringing that made the furniture shake? Well, he certainly hadn't slept quietly, but probably all the more soundly for that. But what should he do now? The next train left at seven o'clock. To make it, he would have to hurry like a madman, and, on, and the line of samples wasn't packed yet, and he himself didn't feel especially fresh and ready to march around. And even if he did make the train... He could not avoid getting it from the boss, because the messenger boy had been waiting at the five o'clock train and would have long ago reported his not showing up. He was a tool of the boss without brains or backbone. What if he were to say he was sick? But 
that would be extremely embarrassing and suspicious because during his five years with the firm, Gregor had not been sick even once. The boss would be sure to come with a health insurance doctor, blame his parents for their lazy son, and cut off all excuses by quoting the health insurance doctor for whom the world consisted of people who were completely healthy but afraid to work. And besides, in this case, would he be so very wrong? In fact, Gregor felt fine with the exception of his drowsiness, which was really unnecessary after sleeping so late, and he even had a ravenous appetite. Just as he was thinking all this over at top speed, without being able to decide to get out of bed, the alarm clock had just struck a quarter to seven. He heard a cautious knocking at the door next to the head of his bed. Gregor, someone called. It was, it was his mother. It's a quarter to seven. Didn't you want to catch the train? What a soft voice. Gregor was shocked to hear his own voice answering, unmistakably his own voice, true, but in which, as if from below, an insistent, distressed chirping intruded, which left the clarity of his words intact only for a moment, really, before so badly garbling them as they carried that no one could be sure if he had heard right. Gregor had wanted to answer in detail and to explain everything, but, given the circumstances, confined himself to saying, Yes, yes, thanks, Mother, I'm just getting up. The wooden door must have prevented the change in Gregor's voice from being noticed outside because his mother was satisfied with this explanation and shuffled off. But their little exchange had made the rest of the family aware that, contrary to expectations, Gregor was still in the house and already his father was knocking it on one of the side doors, feebly, but with his fist. Gregor, Gregor, he called. What's going on? And after a little while, he called again in a deeper warning voice. Gregor, Gregor. At the other side door, however, his sister moaned gently. Gregor, is something the matter with you? Do you want anything? Toward both sides, Gregor answered, I'm all ready and made an effort by meticulous pronunciation and by inserting long pauses between individual words to eliminate everything from his voice that might betray him. His father went back to his breakfast, but his sister whispered, Gregor, open up. I'm pleading with you. But Gregor had absolutely no intention of opening the door and complimented himself, instead on the precaution he had adopted from his business trips of locking all the doors during the night, even at home. First of all, he wanted to get up quietly, without any excitement, get dressed, and, the main thing, have breakfast, and only then think about what to do next, for he saw clearly that in bed he would never think things through to a rational conclusion. He remembered how, even in the past, he had often felt some kind of slight pain, possibly caused by lying in an uncomfortable position which, when he got up, turned out to be purely imaginary, and he was eager to see how today's fantasy would gradually fade away that the change in his voice was nothing more than the first sign of a bad cold and an occupational ailment of the traveling salesman, he had no doubt in the least. It was very easy to throw off the cover. All he had to do was puff himself up a little, and it fell off by itself. But after this, things got difficult, especially since he was so unusually broad. He would have needed hands and arms to lift himself up, but instead of that he had only his numerous little legs, which were in every different kind of perpetual motion and which, besides, he could not control. If he wanted to bend one, the first thing that happened was that it stretched itself out, and if he finally succeeded in getting his leg to do what he wanted, all the others in the meantime, as if set free, began to work in the most intensely painful agitation. Just don't stay in bed being useless, Gregor said to himself. First he tried to get out of bed with the lower part of his body, but this lower part which, by the way, he had not seen yet and which he could not form a clear picture of, proved too difficult to budge. It was taking so long, and when finally almost out of his mind he lunged forward with all his force, without caring, he had picked the wrong direction and slammed himself violently against the lower bedpost. And the searing pain he felt taught him that exactly the lower part of his body was, for the moment anyway, the most sensitive. He therefore tried to get the upper part of his body out of bed first and warily turned his head toward the edge of the bed. This worked easily, and in spite of its width and weight, the mass of his body finally followed, slowly, the movement of his head. But when at last he stuck his head over the edge of the bed into the air, he got too scared to continue any further, since if he finally let himself fall in this position, it would be a miracle if he didn't injure his head. And just now, he had better not, for the life of him, lose consciousness. 
he would rather stay in bed. But when, once again after the same exertion, he lay in his original position, sighing, and again watched his little legs struggling, if possible more fiercely, with each other, and saw no way of bringing peace and order into this mindless motion, he again told himself that it was impossible for him to stay in bed, and that the most rational thing was to make any sacrifice for even the smallest hope of freeing himself from the bed. But at the same time, he did not forget to remind himself occasionally that thinking things over more calmly, indeed, as calmly as possible, was much better than jumping to desperate decisions. At such moments, he fixed his eyes as sharply as possible on the window, but unfortunately, there was little confidence and cheer to be gotten from the view of the morning fog, which shrouded even the other side of the narrow street. Seven o'clock already, he said to himself, as the alarm clock struck again. Seven o'clock already, and still such a fog. And for a little while he lay quietly, breathing shallowly, as if expecting, perhaps, from the complete silence the return of things to the way they really and naturally were. But then he said to himself, Before it strikes a quarter past seven, I must be completely out of bed without fail. Anyway, by that time, someone from the firm will be here to find out where I am, since the office opens before seven. And now he started rocking the complete length of his body out of the bed with a smooth rhythm. If he let himself topple out of bed in this way, his head, which on falling he planned to lift up sharply, would presumably remain unharmed. His back seemed to be hard. Nothing was likely to happen to it when it fell onto the carpet. His biggest misgiving came from his concern about the loud crash that was bound to occur and would probably create, if not terror, at least anxiety behind all the doors. But that would have to be risked. When Gregor's body already projected halfway out of the bed, the new method was more of a game than a struggle. He only had to keep on rocking and jerking himself along. He thought how simple everything would be if he could get some help. Two strong persons, he thought of his father and the maid, would have been completely sufficient. They would only have had to shove their arms under his arched back, in this way scoop him off the bed, bend down with their burden, and then just be careful and patient while he managed to swing himself down onto the floor, where his little legs would hopefully acquire some purpose. Well, leaving out the fact that the doors were locked, should he really call for help? In spite of all his miseries, he could not repress a smile at this thought. He was already so far along that when he rocked more strongly he could hardly keep his balance and very soon he would have to commit himself because in five minutes it would be a quarter past seven when the doorbell rang. It's someone from the firm, he said to himself and almost froze while his little legs only danced more quickly. For a moment, everything remained quiet. They're not going to answer, Grigor said to himself, captivated by some senseless hope. But then, of course, the maid went to the door as usual with her firm stride and opened up. Gregor only had to hear the visitor's first word of greeting to know who it was, the office manager himself. Why was only Gregor condemned to work for a firm where at the slightest omission they immediately suspected the worst? Were all employees louts without exception? Wasn't there a single loyal, dedicated worker among them who, when he had not fully utilized a few hours of the morning for the firm, was driven half-mad by pangs of conscience, and was actually unable to get out of bed? Really, wouldn't it have been enough to send one of the apprentices to find out, if this prying were absolutely necessary? Did the manager himself have to come, and did the whole innocent family have to be shown in this way that the investigation of this suspicious affair could be entrusted only to the intellect of the manager? and more as a result of the excitement produced in Gregor by these thoughts than as a result of any real decision, he swung himself out of bed with all his might. There was a loud thump, but it was not a real crash. The fall was broken a little by the carpet, and Gregor's back was more elastic than he had thought, which explained the not very noticeable muffled sound. Only he had not held his head carefully enough and hit it. He turned it and rubbed it on the carpet in anger and pain. Something fell in there, said the manager in the room on the left. Gregor tried to imagine whether something like what had happened to him today could one day happen even to the manager. He really had to grant the possibility. But, as if in rude reply to this question, the manager took a few decisive steps in the next room and made his patent leather boots creak. From the room on the right, his sister whispered to inform Gregor, Gregor, the manager is here. <laughs> 
I know, Gregor said to himself, but he did not dare raise his voice enough for his sister to hear. Gregor, his father now said from the room on the left, the manager has come and wants to be informed why you didn't catch the early train. We don't know what we should say to him. Besides, he wants to speak to you personally, so please open the door. He will certainly be so kind as to excuse the disorder of the room. Good morning, Mr. Samsa, the manager called in a friendly voice. There's something the matter with him, his mother said. Believe me, sir, there's something the matter with him. Otherwise, how would Gregor have missed a train? That boy has nothing on his mind but the business. It's almost begun to rile me that he never goes out nights. He's been back in the city for eight days now, but every night he's been home. He sits there with us at the table, quietly reading the paper or studying timetables. It's already a distraction for him when he's busy working with his fret saw. For instance, in the span of two or three evenings, he's he, he carved a little frame. You'll be amazed how pretty it is. It's hanging inside his room. You'll see it right away when Gregor opens the door. You know, I'm, I'm glad that you've come, sir. We would have never gotten Gregor to open the door by ourselves. He's so stubborn. And there's certainly something wrong with him, even though he said this morning there wasn't. I'm coming right away, said Gregor, slowly and deliberately, not moving in order not to miss a word of the conversation. I haven't any other explanation myself, said the manager. I hope it's nothing serious. On, other, on the other hand, I must say that we businessmen, fortunately or unfortunately, whichever you prefer, very often simply have to overcome a slight indisposition for business reasons. So can the manager come in now? Asked his father, impatient, and knocked on the door again. No, said Gregor. In the room on the left, there was an embarrassing silence. In the room on the right, his sister began to sob. Why didn't his sister go in to the others? She had probably just got out of bed and not even started to get dressed. Then what was she crying about? Because he didn't get up and didn't let the manager in? Because he was in danger of losing his job and because then the boss would start hounding his parents about the old debts? For the time being, certainly her worries were unnecessary. Gregor was still here and hadn't the slightest intention of letting the family down. True, at the moment, he was lying on the carpet, and no one knowing his condition could seriously have expected him to let the manager in. But just because of this slight discourtesy for which an appropriate excuse could easily be found later on, Gregor could not simply be dismissed. And to Gregor it seemed much more sensible to leave him alone now than to bother him with crying and persuasion. But it was just the uncertainty that was tormenting the others and excused their behavior. Mr. Samsa, the manager now called, raising his voice. What's the matter? You barricade yourself in your room, answer only yes and no, cause your parents serious, unnecessary worry, and you neglect, I mention this only in passing, your duties to the firm in a really shocking manner. I am speaking here in the name of your parents and of your employer and ask you in all seriousness for an immediate, clear explanation. I'm amazed. Amazed. I... I thought I knew you to be a quiet, reasonable person, and now you suddenly seem to want to start strutting about, flaunting strange whims. The head of the firm did suggest to me this morning a possible explanation for your tardiness. It concerned the cash payments recently entrusted to you, but really, I practically gave my word of honor that this explanation could not be right. But now, seeing your incomprehensible obstinacy, I am about to lose even the slightest desire to stick up for you in any way at all. And your job is not the most secure. Originally, I intended to tell you all this in private, but since you make me waste my time here for nothing, I don't see why your parents shouldn't hear it too. Your performance of late has been very unsatisfactory. I know it is not the best season for doing business. We all recognize that. But a season for not doing any business? There is no such thing, Mr. Samsa. Such a thing cannot be tolerated. But sir cried Gregor, beside himself, in his excitement for getting everything else. I'm just opening up, in a minute. A slight indisposition, a dizzy spell, prevented me from getting up. I'm still in bed, but I already feel fine again. I'm just getting out of bed. Just be patient for a minute. I'm not as well as I thought yet. But really, I'm fine. How something like this could just take a person by surprise? Only last night I was fine. My parents can tell you, or... Wait, last night I already had a slight premonition... They must have been able to tell by looking at me. Why didn't I report it to the office? But you always think that you'll get over a sickness without staying home. 
sir, spare my parents. There's, there's no basis for any of the accusations that you're making against me now. No one has ever said a word to me about them. Perhaps you haven't seen the last orders I sent in. Anyway, I'm, I'm, st- I'm still going on the road with the 8 o'clock train. These few hours of rest have done me good. Don't let me keep you, sir. I'll be at the office myself right away. And be so kind as to tell them this and give my respects to the head of the firm. And while Gregor hastily blurted all this out, hardly knowing what he was saying, he had easily approached the chest of drawers, probably as a result of the practice he had already gotten in bed, and now he tried to raise himself up against it. He actually intended to open the door, to actually present himself and speak to the manager. He was eager to find out what the others, who were now so anxious to see him, would say at the sight of him. If they were shocked, then Gregor had no further responsibility and could be calm. But if they took everything calmly, then he, too, had no reason to get excited and could, if he hurried, actually be at the station by eight o'clock. At first, he slid off the polished chest of drawers a few times. But at last, giving himself a final push, he stood upright. He no longer paid any attention to the pains in his abdomen, no matter how much they were burning. Now, he let himself fall against the back of a nearby chair, clinging to its slats with his little legs. But by doing this... He had gotten control of himself and fell silent, since he could now listen to what the manager was saying. "'Did you understand a word?' the manager was asking his parents. "'He isn't trying to make fools of us, is he?' "'My God!' cried his mother, already in tears. "'Maybe he's seriously ill, and here we are torturing him.' "'Greta! Greta!' she then cried. "'Mother?' called his sister from the other side. They communicated by way of Gregor's room. "'Go to the doctor immediately. Gregor is sick.' Hurry, get the doctor. Did you just hear Gregor talking? That was the voice of an animal, said the manager, in a tone conspicuously soft compared with the mother's yelling. Anna, Anna, the father called through the foyer into the kitchen, clapping his hands. Get a locksmith right away. And already the two girls were running with rustling skirts through the foyer. How could his sister have gotten dressed so quickly? And tearing open the door to the apartment, the door could not be heard slamming. They had probably left it open as is the custom in homes where great misfortune has occurred. But Gregor had become much calmer. It was true that they no longer understood his words, though they had seemed clear enough to him, clearer than before, probably because his ear had grown accustomed to them. But still, the others now believed that there was something the matter with him, and were ready to help him. The assurance and confidence with which the first measures had been taken did him good. He felt integrated into human society once again and hoped for marvelous, amazing feats from both the doctor and the locksmith, without really distinguishing sharply between them. In order to make his voice as clear as possible for the crucial discussions that were approaching, he cleared his throat a little, taking pains, of course, to do so in a very muffled manner, since this noise, too, might sound different from human coughing, a thing he no longer trusted himself to decide. In the next room, meanwhile, everything had become completely still. Perhaps his parents were sitting at the table with the manager, whispering. Perhaps they were all leaning against the door and listening. Gregor slowly lugged himself toward the door, pushing the chair in front of him, then let go of it, threw himself against the door, and held himself upright against it. The pads on the bottom of his little legs exuded a little sticky substance, and for a moment rested there from the exertion but then he got started turning the key in the lock with his mouth. Unfortunately, it seemed that he had no real teeth. What was he supposed to grip the key with? But in compensation, his jaws, of course, were very strong, and with their help, he actually got the key moving and paid no attention to the fact that he was undoubtedly hurting himself in some way, for a brown liquid came out of his mouth, flowed over the key, and dripped onto the floor. Listen, said the manager in the next room. He's turning the key. This was great encouragement to Gregor, but everyone should have cheered him on. His father and mother, too. Go, Gregor, they should have called. Keep going at that lock. Harder, harder. And in the delusion that they were all following his efforts with suspense, he clamped his jaws madly on the key with all the strength he could muster. Depending on the progress of the key, he danced around the lock, holding himself upright only by his mouth. He clung to the key as the situation demanded or pressed it down again with the whole weight of his body. The clearer click of the lock as it finally snapped back literally woke Gregor up. With a sigh of relief, he said to himself, So I didn't need the locksmith after all, and laid his head down on the handle in order to open wide. 
one wing of the double doors. Since he had to use this method of opening the door, it was really opened very wide, while he himself was still invisible. He first had to edge slowly around the one wing of the door, and do so very carefully, if he was not to fall flat on his back just before entering. He was still busy with this difficult maneuver and had no time to pay attention to anything else when he heard the manager burst out with a loud, Oh! It sounded like a rush of wind, and now he could see him standing closest to the door, his hand pressed over his open mouth, slowly backing away as if repulsed by an invisible, unrelenting force. His mother, in spite of the manager's presence, she stood with her hair still unbraided from the night, sticking out in all directions, first looked at his father with her hands clasped, then took two steps toward Gregor and sank down in the midst of her skirt spreading out around her, her face completely hidden on her breast. With a hostile expression, his father clenched his fist as if to drive Gregor back into his room, then looked uncertainly around the living room, shielded his eyes with his hands, and sobbed with heaves into his powerful chest. Now Gregor did not enter the room after all, but leaned against the inside of the firmly bolted wing of the door, so that only half his body was visible and his head above it, cocked to one side and peeping out at the others. In the meantime, it had grown much lighter. Across the street one could see clearly a section of the endless, grayish-black building opposite. It was a hospital, with its regular windows starkly piercing the facade. The rain was still coming down, but only in large, separately visible drops that were also pelting the ground, literally, one at a time. The breakfast dishes were laid out lavishly on the table, since for his father breakfast was the most important meal of the day, which he would prolong for hours while reading various newspapers. On the wall directly opposite hung a photograph of Gregor from his army days, in a lieutenant's uniform, his hand on his sword, a carefree smile on his lips, demanding respect for his bearing and his rank. The door to the foyer was open, and since the front door was open too, it was possible to see out onto the landing and the top of the stairs going down. Well, said Gregor, and he was thoroughly aware of being the only one who had kept calm, I'll get dressed right away, pack up my samples, and go. Will you, will you please let me go? Now, sir, you see, I'm not stubborn, and I'm willing to work. Traveling is a hardship, but without it I couldn't live. Where are you going, sir? To the office? Yes. Will you give me an honest report of everything? A man might find for a moment that he was unable to work, but that's exactly the right time to remember his past accomplishments and to consider that later on, when the obstacle has been removed, he's bound to work all the harder and more efficiently. I'm under so many obligations to the head of the firm, as you know very well. Besides, I also have my parents and my sister to worry about. I'm in a tight spot, but I'll also work my way out again. Don't make things harder for me than they already are. Stick up for me in the office, please. Traveling salesmen aren't well liked there, I know. People think they make a fortune leading the gay life. No one has any particular reason to rectify this prejudice. But you, sir, you have a better perspective on things than the rest of the office. An even better perspective, just between the two of us, than the head of the firm himself, who, in his capacity as owner easily lets his judgment be swayed against an employee. And you also know very well that the traveling salesman, who is out of the office practically the whole year round, can so easily become the victim of gossip, coincidences, and unfounded accusations against which he's completely unable to defend himself, since in most cases he knows nothing at all about them except when he returns exhausted from a trip and back home gets to suffer on his own person the grim consequences which can no longer be traced back to their cause. Sir, don't go away without a word to tell me you think I'm at least partly right. But at Gregor's first words, the manager had already turned away and with curled lips looked back at Gregor over his twitching shoulder. And during Gregor's speech, he did not stand still for a minute, but without letting Gregor out of his sight, backed toward the door, yet very gradually, as if there were some secret prohibition against leaving the room he was already in the foyer, and from the sudden movement with which he took his last step from the living room, one might have thought he had just burned the sole of his foot. In the foyer, however, he stretched his right hand far out toward the staircase, as if nothing less than an unearthly deliverance were awaiting him there. Gregor realized that he must on no account let the manager go away in this mood if his position in the firm were not to be jeopardized in the extreme. 
His parents did not understand this too well. In the course of the years, they had formed the conviction that Gregor was set for life in this firm, and furthermore, they were so preoccupied with their immediate troubles that they had lost all consideration for the future. But Gregor had this forethought. The manager must be detained, calmed down, convinced, and finally won over. Gregor's and the family's future depended on it. If only his sister had been there. She was perceptive. She had already begun to cry when Gregor was still lying calmly on his back. And certainly the manager, this lady's man, would have listened to her. She would have shut the front door and in the foyer talked him out of his scare, but his sister was not there. Gregor had to handle the situation himself. And without stopping to realize that he had no idea what his new faculties of movement were, and without stopping to realize either that his speech had possibly, indeed probably, not been understood again, he let go of the wing of the door, he shoved himself through the opening, intending to go to the manager, who was already on the landing, ridiculously holding on to the banisters with both hands, but groping for support. Gregor immediately fell down with a little cry onto his numerous little legs. This had hardly happened when... For the first time that morning, he had a feeling of physical well-being. His little legs were on firm ground. They obeyed him completely, as he noted to his joy. They even strained to carry him away wherever he wanted to go, and he already believed that final recovery from all his sufferings was imminent. But at that final moment, as he lay on the floor rocking with repressed motion, not far away from his mother and just opposite her, she, who had seemed so completely self-absorbed, all at once jumped up, her arms stretched wide, her fingers spread, and cried, Help! For God's sake, help! Held her head, bent as if to see Gregor better, but inconsistently darted madly backward instead, had forgotten that the table laden with breakfast dishes stood behind her, sat down on it hastily as if her thoughts were elsewhere, when she reached it, and did not seem to notice at all that near her the big coffee pot had been knocked over and the coffee was pouring in a steady stream onto the rug. Mother! Mother! said Gregor softly and looked up at her. For a moment, the manager had completely slipped his mind. On the other hand, at the sight of the spilling coffee, he could not resist snapping his jaws several times in the air. At this, his mother screamed once more, fled from the table, and fell into the arms of his father, who came rushing up to her. But Gregor had no time now for his parents. The manager was already on the stairs with his chin on the banister. He was taking a last look back. Gregor was off to a running start to be as sure as possible of catching up with him. The manager must have suspected something like this, for he leaped down several steps and disappeared. But he still shouted, Ah! And the sound carried through the whole staircase. Unfortunately, the manager's flight now seemed to confuse his father completely, who had been relatively calm until now. For instead of running after the manager himself, or at least not hindering Gregor in his pursuit, he seized in his right hand the manager's cane, which had been left behind on a chair with his hat and overcoat, picked up in his left hand a heavy newspaper from the table, and stamping his feet, started brandishing the cane and the newspaper to drive Gregor back into his room. No plea of Gregor's helped. No plea was even understood. However humbly he might turn his head, his father merely stamped his feet more forcefully. Across the room, his mother had thrown open a window in spite of the cool weather, and leaning out, she buried her face far outside the window in her hands. Between the alley and the staircase, a strong draft was created, and the window curtains blew in, the newspapers on the table rustled. Single sheets fluttered across the floor. Pitilessly, his father came on, hissing like a wild man. Now, Gregor had not had any practice at all, walking in reverse. It was really very slow going. If Gregor had only been allowed to turn around, he could have gotten into his room right away, but he was afraid to make his father impatient by this time-consuming gyration, and at any minute... The cane in his father's hand threatened to come down on his back or his head with a deadly blow. Finally, however, Gregor had no choice, for he noticed with horror that in reverse he could not even keep going in one direction. And so, incessantly throwing uneasy side glances at his father, he began to turn around as quickly as possible, in reality turning only very slowly. Perhaps his father realized his good intentions, for he did not interfere with him. Instead, he even now and then directed the maneuver from afar with the tip of his cane. If only his father did not keep making this intolerable hissing sound, it made Gregor lose his head completely. He had almost finished the turn when, his mind continually on this hissing, he made a mistake and even started turning back around to his original position. But when he had at last successfully managed to get his head in front of the open door, it turned out that his body was too broad to get through as it was.
Of course, in his father's present state of mind, it did not even remotely occur to him to open the other wing of the door in order to give Gregor enough room to pass through. He had only the fixed idea that Gregor must return to his room as quickly as possible. He would never have allowed the complicated preliminaries Gregor needed to go through in order to stand up on one end and perhaps in this way fit through the door. Instead, he drove Gregor on as if there were no obstacle. With exceptional loudness, the voice behind Gregor did not sound like that of only a single father. Now, this was really no joke anymore, and Gregor forced himself, come what may, into the doorway. One side of his body rose up. He lay lopsided in the opening. One of his flanks was scraped raw. Ugly blotches marred the white floor. Soon he got stuck and could not have budged any more by himself. His little legs on one side dangled tremblingly in midair. Those on the other were painfully crushed against the floor. When from behind his father gave him a hard shove, which was truly his salvation, and bleeding profusely, he flew far into his room. The door was slammed shut with the cane. Then at last, everything was quiet. Chapter 2 It was already dusk when Gregor awoke from his deep, coma-like sleep. Even if he had not been disturbed, he would certainly not have woken up much later, for he felt that he had rested and slept long enough. But it seemed to him that a hurried step and a cautious shutting of the door leading to the foyer had awakened him. The light of the electric street lamps lay in pallid streaks on the ceiling and on the upper parts of the furniture, but underneath, where Gregor was, it was dark. Groping clumsily with his antenna, which he was only now beginning to appreciate, he slowly dragged himself toward the door to see what had been happening there. His left side felt like one single long, unpleasantly tautening scar, and he actually had to limp on his two rows of legs. Besides, one little leg had been seriously injured in the course of the morning's events. It was almost a miracle that only one had been injured and dragged along lifelessly. Only after he got to the door did he notice what had really attracted him, the smell of something to eat. For there stood a bowl filled with fresh milk in which small slices of white bread were floating. He could almost have laughed for joy since he was even hungrier than he had been in the morning, and he immediately dipped his head into the milk almost over his eyes. But he soon drew it back again, in disappointment, not only because he had difficulty in eating on account of the soreness in his left side, and he could eat only if his whole panting body cooperated, but because he didn't like the milk at all, although it used to be his favorite drink, and that was certainly why his sister had put it in the room. In fact, he turned away from the bowl almost with repulsion and crawled back to the middle of the room. In the living room, as Gregor saw through the crack in the door, the gas had been lit. But while at this hour of the day his father was in the habit of reading the afternoon newspaper in a loud voice to his mother, and sometimes to his sister too, now there wasn't a sound. Well, perhaps this custom of reading aloud, which his sister was always telling him and writing him about, had recently been discontinued altogether. But in all the other rooms, too, it was just as still, although the apartment certainly was not empty. What a quiet life the family has been leading, Gregor said to himself, and while he stared rigidly in front of him into the darkness, he felt very proud that he had been able to provide such a life in so nice an apartment for his parents and his sister. But what now if all the peace, the comfort, the contentment were to come to a horrible end? In order to not get involved in such thoughts, Gregor decided to keep moving, and he crawled up and down the room. During the long evening, first one of the side doors and then the other was opened a small crack and quickly shut again. Someone had probably had the urge to come in and then had had second thoughts. Gregor now settled into position right by the living room door, determined somehow to get the hesitating visitor to come in, or at least to find out who it might be. But the door was not opened again, and Gregor waited in vain. In the morning when the doors had been locked, everyone had wanted to come in, and now that he had opened one of the doors and the others had evidently been opened during the day, no one came in, and now the keys were even inserted on the outside. It was late at night when the light finally went out in the living room, and now it was easy for Gregor to tell that his parents and his sister had stayed up so long, since, as he could distinctly hear, all three were now retiring on tiptoe. Certainly no one would come in to Gregor until the morning, and so he had ample time to consider, undisturbed, how best to rearrange his life. But the empty high ceiling room in which he was forced to lie flat on the floor made him nervous, without his being able to tell why, since 
It was, after all, the room in which he had lived for the past five years. And turning half unconsciously and not without a slight feeling of shame, he scuttled under the couch where, although his back was a little crushed and he could not raise his head any more, he immediately felt very comfortable and was only sorry that his body was too wide to completely go under the couch. There he stayed the whole night, which he spent partly in a sleepy trance, from which hunger pangs kept waking him with a start, partly in worries and vague hopes, all of which, however, led to the conclusion that for the time being he would have to lie low, and, by being patient and showing his family every possible consideration, help them bear the inconvenience which he simply had to cause them in his present condition. Early in the morning, it was still almost night, Gregor had the opportunity of testing the strength of the resolutions he had just made, for his sister, almost fully dressed, opened the door from the foyer and looked in eagerly. She did not see him right away, but when she caught sight of him under the couch, God, he, he had to be somewhere, he couldn't just fly away, she became so frightened that she lost control of herself and slammed the door shut again. But, as if she felt sorry for her behavior, she immediately opened the door again and came in on tiptoe, as if she were visiting someone seriously ill, or perhaps even a stranger. Gregor had pushed his head forward just to the edge of the couch and was watching her. Would she notice that he had left the milk standing, and not because he hadn't been hungry, and would she bring in a dish of something he'd like better? If she were not going to do it of her own free will, he would rather starve than call it to her attention, although really he felt an enormous urge to shoot out from under the couch, throw himself at his sister's feet, and beg her for something good to eat. But his sister noticed at once, to her astonishment, that the bowl was still full, only a little milk was spilled around it. She picked it up immediately, not with her bare hands, of course, but with a rag, and carried it out. Gregor was extremely curious to know what she would bring him instead, and he racked his brains on the subject. But he would never have been able to guess what his sister, in the goodness of her heart, actually did. To find out his likes and dislikes, she brought him a wide assortment of things, all spread out on an old newspaper. Old, half rotten vegetables, bones left over from the evening meal, caked with congealed white sauce, some raisins and almonds, a piece of cheese, which, two days before, Gregor had declared inedible, a plain slice of bread, a slice of bread and butter, and one with butter and salt. In addition to all this, she put down some water in the bowl, apparently permanently earmarked for Gregor's use. And out of a sense of delicacy, since she knew that Gregor would not eat in front of her, she left hurriedly and even turned the key, just so that Gregor should know that he might make himself as comfortable as he wanted. Gregor's legs began whirring now that he was going to eat. Besides, his bruises must have completely healed since he no longer felt any handicap, and marveling at this, he thought how, over a month ago, he had cut his finger very slightly with a knife, and how this wound was still hurting him only the day before yesterday. Have I become less sensitive? he thought. Already sucking greedily at the cheese, which had immediately and forcibly attracted him ahead of all the other dishes. One ride after the other, and with eyes streaming with tears of contentment, he devoured the cheese, the vegetables, and the sauce. The fresh foods, on the other hand, he did not care for. He couldn't even stand their smell, and even dragged the things he wanted to eat a bit farther away. He had finished with everything long since, and was just lying lazily at the same spot, when his sister slowly turned the key as a sign for him to withdraw. That immediately startled him, although he was almost asleep, and he scuttled under the couch again but it took great self-control for him to stay under the couch, even for the short time his sister was in the room, since his body had become a little bloated from the heavy meal, and in his cramped position he could hardly breathe. In between slight attacks of suffocation he watched with bulging eyes as his unsuspecting sister took a broom and swept up, not only his leavings, but even the foods which Gregor had left completely untouched, as if they too were no longer usable and dumping everything hastily into a pail, which she covered with a wooden lid, she carried everything out. She had hardly turned her back when Gregor came out from under the couch, stretching and puffing himself up. This, then, was the way Gregor was fed each day, once in the morning, when his parents and the maid were still asleep, and the second time in the afternoon, after everyone had had dinner, for then his parents took a short nap again, and the maid could be sent out by his sister on some errand. Certainly, they did not want him to starve either, but perhaps they would not have been able to stand knowing any more about his meals than 
from hearsay, or perhaps his sister wanted to spare them even what was possibly only a minor torment, for really, they were suffering enough as it was. Gregor could not find out what excuses had been made to get rid of the doctor and the locksmith on that first morning, for since the others could not understand what he said, it did not occur to any of them, not even to his sister, that he could understand what they said, and so he had to be satisfied when his sister was in the room with only occasionally hearing her sides and appeals to the saints. It was only later when she had begun to get used to everything, there could never, of course, be any question of a complete adjustment, that Gregor sometimes caught a remark which was meant to be friendly or could be interpreted as such. Oh, he liked what he had today, she would say when Gregor had tucked away a good helping, and in the opposite case, which gradually occurred more and more frequently, she used to say, almost sadly, he's left everything again. But if Gregor could not get any news directly, he overheard a great deal from the neighboring rooms, and as soon as he heard voices, he would immediately run to the door, concerned, and press his whole body against it. Especially in the early days, there was no conversation that was not somehow about him, if only implicitly. For two whole days, there were family consultations at every meal time about how they should cope. This was also the topic of discussion between meals, for at least two members of the family were always home, since no one probably wanted to stay home alone, and it was impossible to leave the apartment completely empty. Besides, on the very first day the maid, it was not completely clear what and how much she knew of what had happened, had begged his mother on bended knees to dismiss her immediately, and when she had said goodbye a quarter of an hour later, she thanked them in tears for the dismissal as if for the greatest favor that had ever been done to her in this house, and made a solemn vow, without anyone asking for her for it, not to give anything away to anyone. Now his sister, working with her mother, had to do the cooking too, of course, that did not cause her much trouble since they hardly ate anything. Gregor was always hearing one of them pleading in vain with one of the others to eat, and getting no answer except, thanks I've had enough, or something similar. They did not seem to drink anything either. His sister often asked her father if he wanted any beer, and gladly offered to go out for it herself, and when he did not answer she said, in order to remove any hesitation on his part, that she could also send the janitor's wife to get it. But then his father finally answered with a definite no, and that was the end of it. In the course of the very first day, his father explained the family's financial situation and prospects to both the mother and the sister. From time to time, he got up from the table to get some kind of receipt or notebook out of the little strong box he had rescued from the collapse of his business five years before. Gregor heard him open the complicated lock and secure it again after taking out what he had been looking for. These explanations by his father were, to some extent, the first pleasant news Gregor had heard since his imprisonment. He had always believed that his father had not been able to save a penny from the business. At least his father had never told him anything to the contrary, and Gregor, for his part, had never asked him any questions. In those days, Gregor's sole concern had been to do everything in his power to make the family forget as quickly as possible the business disaster which had plunged everyone into a state of total despair. And so he had begun to work with special ardor and had risen almost overnight from stock clerk to traveling salesman, which of course had opened up very different money-making possibilities. And in no time, his successes on the job were transformed by means of commissions into hard cash that could be plunked down on the table at home in front of his astonished and delighted family. Those had been wonderful times, and they had never returned, at least not with the same glory, although later on Gregor earned enough money to meet the expenses of the entire family and actually did so. They had just gotten used to it, the family as well as Gregor. The money was received with thanks and given with pleasure, but no special feeling of warmth went with it anymore. Only his sister had remained close to Gregor, and it was his secret plan that she who, unlike him, loved music and could play the violin movingly, should be sent next year to the conservatory, regardless of the great expense involved, which could surely be made up for in some other way. Often, during Gregor's short stays in the city, the conservatory would come up in his conversations with his sister, but always merely as a beautiful dream which was not supposed to come true, and his parents were not happy to hear even these innocent illusions. But Gregor had very concrete ideas on the subject, and he intended solemnly to announce his plan on Christmas Eve. Thoughts like these, completely useless in his present state, went through his head as he stood glued to the door, listening. Sometimes, out of general exhaustion, he could not listen anymore and let his head bump carelessly against the door, 
but immediately pulled it back again, for even the slight noise he made by doing this had been heard in the next room and made them all lapse into silence. "'What's he carrying on about in there now?' said his father after a while, obviously turning toward the door, and only then would the interrupted conversation gradually be resumed. Gregor now learned in a thorough way, for his father was in the habit of often repeating himself in his explanations, partly because he himself had not dealt with these matters for a long time, partly too because his mother did not understand everything the first time around, that in spite of all their misfortunes, a bit of capital, a very little bit, certainly was still intact from the old days, which in the meantime had increased a little through the untouched interest. But besides that, the money Gregor had brought home every month, he had kept only a few dollars for himself, had never been completely used up, and had accumulated into a tidy principle. Behind his door, Gregor nodded emphatically, delighted at this unexpected foresight and thrift. Of course, he actually could have paid off more of his father's debt to the boss with this extra money, and the day on which he could have gotten rid of his job would have been much closer, but now things were undoubtedly better the way his father had arranged them. Now this money was by no means enough to let the family live off the interest. The principal was perhaps enough to support the family for one year, or at the most two, but that was all there was. So it was just a sum that really should not be touched, and that had to be put away for a rainy day, but the money to live on would have to be earned. Now his father was still healthy, certainly, but he was an old man who had not worked for the past five years, and who in any case could not be expected to undertake too much. During these five years, which were the first vacation of his hard-working, yet unsuccessful life, he had gained a lot of weight, and as a result had become fairly sluggish. And was his old mother now supposed to go out and earn money, when she suffered from asthma, when a walk through the apartment was already an ordeal for her, and when she spent every other day lying on the sofa under the open window, gasping for breath? And was his sister now supposed to work, who, for all her seventeen years, was still a child, and whom it would be such a pity to deprive of the life she had led until now, which had consisted of wearing pretty clothes, sleeping late, helping in the house, enjoying a few modest amusements, and, above all, playing the violin. At first, whenever the conversation turned to the necessity of earning money, Gregor would let go of the door and throw himself down on the cool leather sofa which stood beside it, for he felt hot with shame and grief. Often he lay there the whole night long through, not sleeping a wink and only scrabbling on the leather for hours on end, or not balking at the huge effort of pushing an armchair to the window. He would crawl up to the window sill and, propped up in the chair, lean against the window, evidently in some sort of remembrance of the feeling of freedom he used to have from looking out the window. For, in fact, from day to day he saw things even a short distance away less and less distinctly. The hospital opposite, which he used to curse because he saw so much of it, was now completely beyond his range of vision, and if he had not been positive that he was living in Charlotte Street, a quiet but still very much a city street, he might have believed that he was looking out of his window into a desert where the gray sky and the gray earth were indistinguishably fused. It took his observant sister only twice to notice that his armchair was standing by the window for her to push the chair back to the same place by the window each time she had finished cleaning the room, and from then on she even left the inside casement of the window open. If Gregor had only been able to speak to his sister and thank her for everything she had to do for him, he could have accepted her services more easily. As it was, they caused him pain. Of course his sister tried to ease the embarrassment of the whole situation as much as possible, and as time went on she naturally managed it better and better, but in time Gregor, too, saw things much more clearly. Even the way she came in was terrible for him. Hardly had she entered the room, then she would run straight to the window without taking time to close the door, though she was usually so careful to spare everyone the sight of Gregor's room, then tear open the casements with eager hands, almost as if she were suffocating, and remain for a little while at the window, even in the coldest weather, breathing deeply. With this racing and crashing, she frightened Gregor twice a day, the whole time he cowered under the couch, and yet he knew very well that she would certainly have spared him this if only she had found it possible to stand, being in a room with him, with the window closed. One time, it must have been a month since Gregor's metamorphosis, and there was certainly no particular reason any more for his sister to be astonished at Gregor's appearance. She came a little earlier than usual, and caught Gregor still looking out the window, immobile, and so 
in an excellent position to be terrifying. It would not have surprised Gregor if she had not come in, because his position prevented her from immediately opening the window. But not only did she not come in, she even sprang back and locked the door. A stranger might easily have thought that Gregor had been lying in wait for her, wanting to bite her. Of course, Gregor immediately hid under the couch. He had to wait until noon before his sister came again, and she seemed much more uneasy than usual. He realized from this that the sight of him was still repulsive to her, and was bound to remain repulsive to her in the future, and that she probably had to overcome a lot of resistance to not run away at the sight of even the small part of his body that jutted out from under the couch. So, to spare her even this sight, one day he carried the sheet on his back to the couch. The job took four hours, and arranged it in such a way that he was now completely covered up and his sister could not see him even when she stooped. If she had considered this sheet unnecessary, then of course she could have removed it, for it was clear enough that it could not be for his own pleasure that Gregor shut himself off altogether. But she left the sheet the way it was, and Gregor thought that he had even caught a grateful look when one time he cautiously lifted the sheet a little with his head in order to see how his sister was taking the new arrangement. During the first two weeks, his parents could not bring themselves to come in to him, and often he heard them say how much they appreciated his sister's work, whereas until now they had frequently been annoyed with her because she had struck them as being a little useless. But now both of them, his father and his mother, often waited outside Gregor's room while his sister straightened it up, and as soon as she came out, she had to tell them in great detail how the room looked, what Gregor had eaten, how he had behaved this time, and whether he had perhaps shown a little improvement. His mother, incidentally, began relatively soon to want to visit Gregor, but his father and his sister at first held her back with reasonable arguments, to which Gregor listened very attentively and of which he wholeheartedly approved. But later she had to be restrained by force, and then when she cried out, Let me go to Gregor, he is my unfortunate boy. Don't you understand that I have to go to him? Gregor thought that it might be a good idea, after all, if his mother did come in. Not every day, of course, but perhaps once a week. She could still do everything much better than his sister, who, for all her courage, was still only a child, and in the final analysis had perhaps taken on such a difficult assignment only out of childish flightiness. Gregor's desire to see his mother was soon fulfilled. During the day, Gregor did not want to show himself at the window, if only out of consideration for his parents. But he couldn't crawl very far on his few square yards of floor space, either. He could hardly put up with just lying still, even at night. Eating soon stopped giving him the slightest pleasure, so as a distraction, he adopted the habit of crawling crisscross over the walls and the ceiling. He especially liked hanging from the ceiling. It was completely different from lying on the floor. One could breathe more freely. A faint swinging sensation went through the body, and in the almost happy absent-mindedness which Gregor felt up there, it could happen to his own surprise that he let go and plopped onto the floor. But now, of course, he had much better control of his body than before and did not hurt himself even from such a big drop. His sister immediately noticed the new entertainment Gregor had discovered for himself. After all, he left behind traces of his sticky substance wherever he crawled, and so she got it into her head to make it possible for Gregor to crawl on an altogether wider scale, by taking up the furniture which stood in his way, mainly the chest of drawers and the desk. But she was not able to do this by herself. She did not dare ask her father for help. The maid certainly would not have helped her, for although this girl who was about sixteen was bravely sticking it out after the previous cook had left, she had asked for the favor of locking herself in the kitchen at all times and of only opening the door on special request. So there was nothing left for his sister to do except to get her mother one day when her father was out. And his mother did come, with exclamations of excited joy, but she grew silent at the door of Gregor's room. First, his sister looked to see, of course, that everything in the room was in order. Only then did she let her mother come in. Hurrying as fast as he could, Gregor had pulled the sheet down lower still and pleated it more tightly. It really looked just like a sheet accidentally thrown over the couch. This time Gregor also refrained from spying under the sheet. He renounced seeing his mother for the time being, and was simply happy that she had come in after all. "'Come on, you can't see him,' his sister said, evidently leading her mother in by the hand. Now Gregor could hear the two frail women moving the old chest of drawers, heavy for anyone, from its place, and his sister insisting on doing the harder part of the job herself.' 
ignoring the warnings of her mother, who was afraid that she would overexert herself. It went on for a long time. After struggling for a good quarter of an hour, his mother said that they had better leave the chest where it was because, in the first place, it was too heavy, they would not finish before his father came, and with the chest in the middle of the room, Gregor would be completely barricaded, and in the second place, it was not at all certain that they were doing Gregor a favor by removing his furniture. To her, the opposite seemed to be the case. The sight of the bare wall was heartbreaking, and why shouldn't Gregor also have the same feeling since he had been used to his furniture for so long and would feel abandoned in the empty room? And doesn't it look, his mother concluded very softly. In fact, she had been almost whispering the whole time, as if she wanted to avoid letting Gregor, whose exact whereabouts she did not know, hear even the sound of her voice, for she was convinced that he did not understand the words. And doesn't it look as if by removing his furniture we were showing him that we have given up all hope of his getting better and are leaving him to his own devices without any consideration? I think the best thing would be to try to keep the room exactly the way it was before, so that when Gregor comes back to us again, he'll find everything unchanged and can forget all the more easily what's happened in the meantime. When he heard his mother's words, Gregor realized that the monotony of family life, combined with the fact that not a soul had addressed a word directly to him, must have addled his brain in the course of the past two months, for he could not explain to himself in any other way how, in all seriousness, he could have been anxious to have his room cleared out. Had he really wanted to have his warm room, comfortably fitted with furniture that had always been in the family, changed into a cave, in which, of course, he would be able to crawl around unhampered in all directions, but at the cost of simultaneously, rapidly, and totally forgetting the, his human past? Even now, he had been on the verge of forgetting, and only his mother's voice, which he had not heard for so long, had shaken him up. Nothing should be removed. Everything had to stay. He could not do without the beneficial influence of the furniture on his state of mind. And if the furniture prevented him from carrying on this senseless crawling around, then that was no loss, but rather a great advantage. But his sister, unfortunately, had a different opinion. She had become accustomed certainly not entirely without justification, to adopt with her parents the role of the particularly well-qualified expert whenever Gregor's affairs were being discussed, and so her mother's advice was now sufficient reason for her to insist, not only on the removal of the chest of drawers and the desk, which was all she had been planning at first, but also on the removal of all the furniture, with the exception of the indispensable couch." Of course, it was not only childish defiance and the self-confidence she had recently acquired so unexpectedly and at such a cost that led her to make this demand. She had, in fact, noticed that Gregor needed plenty of room to crawl around in, and on the other hand, as best she could tell, he never used the furniture at all. Perhaps, however, the romantic enthusiasm of girls her age, which seeks to indulge itself at every opportunity, played a part by tempting her to make Gregor's situation even more terrifying in order that she might do even more for him. Into a room in which Gregor ruled the bare walls all alone, no human being besides Greta was ever likely to set foot. And so she did not let herself be swerved from her decision by her mother, who, besides, from the sheer anxiety of being in Gregor's room, seemed unsure of herself, soon grew silent and helped her daughter as best she could to get the chest of drawers out of the room. Well, in a pinch... Gregor could do without the chest, but the desk had to stay, and hardly had the woman left the room at the chest, squeezing it against it and groaning, than Gregor stuck his head out from under the couch to see how he could feel his way into the situation as considerately as possible. But unfortunately, it had to be his mother who came back first, while in the next room, Greta was clasping the chest and rocking it back and forth by herself without, of course, bulging it from the spot. His mother, however, was not used to the sight of Gregor. He could have made her ill, and so Gregor, frightened, scuttled in reverse to the far end of the couch, but could not stop the sheet from shifting a little at the front. That was enough to put his mother on the alert. She stopped, stood still for a moment, and then went back to Greta. Although Gregor told himself over and over again that nothing special was happening, only a few pieces of furniture were being moved, he soon had to admit that this coming and going of the women, the little calls to each other, the scraping of the furniture along the floor, had the effect on him of a great turmoil swelling on all sides, and as much he tucked in his head and his legs and shrank until his belly touched the floor. He was forced to admit that he would not be able to stand it much longer. They were clearing out his room, 
depriving him of everything that he loved. They had already carried away the chest of drawers in which he kept the fret saw and other tools, were now budging the desk firmly, embedded in the floor of the desk he had done his homework on when he was a student at business college. In high school, yes, even in public school. Now he had really no more time to examine the good intentions of the two women, whose existence, besides, he had almost forgotten, for they were so exhausted that they were working in silence, and one could hear only the heavy shuffling of their feet. And so he broke out. The women were just leaning against the desk in the next room to catch their breath for a minute, changed his course four times. He really didn't know what to salvage first. Then he saw, hanging conspicuously on the wall, which was otherwise bare already, the picture of the lady, all dressed in furs, hurriedly crawled up on it and pressed himself against the glass, which gave a good surface to stick to and soothed his hot belly. At least no one would take away this picture, while Gregor completely covered it up. He turned his head toward the living room door to watch the women when they returned. They had not given themselves much of a rest and were already coming back. Greta had put her arm around her mother and was practically carrying her. So what should we take now? said Greta, and looked around. At that, her eyes met Gregor's as he clung to the wall. Probably only because of her mother's presence she kept her self-control, bent her head down to her mother to keep her from looking around, and said, though in a quavering and thoughtless voice, Come, we'd better go back into the living room for a minute. Greta's intent was clear to Gregor. She wanted to bring his mother into safety, and then chase him down from the wall. Well, just let her try. He squatted on his picture and would not give it up. He would rather fly in Greta's face. But Greta's words had now made her mother really anxious. She stepped to one side, caught sight of the gigantic brown blotch on the flowered wallpaper, and before it really dawned on her that what she saw was Gregor, she cried in a hoarse, bawling voice, Oh God! Oh God! As if, giving up completely, she fell with outstretched arms across the couch and did not stir. You, Gregor! cried his sister with raised fist and piercing eyes. These were the first words she had addressed directly to him since his metamorphosis. She ran into the next room to get some kind of spirits to revive her mother. Gregor wanted to help, too. There was time to rescue the picture, but he was stuck to the glass and had to tear himself loose by force. Then he, too, ran into the next room, as if he could give his sister some sort of advice, as in the old days. But then had to stand behind her, doing nothing while she rummaged among various little bottles. Moreover, when she turned around, she was startled. A bottle fell on the floor and broke. A splinter of glass wounded Gregor in the face. Some kind of corrosive medicine flowed around him. Now, without waiting any longer, Greta grabbed as many little bottles as she could carry and ran with them inside to her mother. She slammed the door behind her with her foot. Now Gregor was cut off from his mother, who was perhaps near death through his fault. He could not dare open the door if he did not want to chase away his sister, who had to stay with his mother. Now there was nothing for him to do except wait. And tormented by self-reproaches and worry, he began to crawl, crawled over everything, walls, furniture, and ceiling, and finally in desperation, as the whole room was beginning to spin, fell down onto the middle of the big table. A short time passed. Gregor lay there prostrate. All around, things were quiet. Perhaps that was a good sign. Then the doorbell rang. The maid, of course, was locked up in her kitchen, and so Greta had to answer the door. His father had come home. What's happened? were his first words. Greta's appearance must have told him everything. Greta answered in a muffled voice. Her face was obviously pressed against her father's chest. The mother fainted, but she's better now. Gregor's broken out. I knew it, his father said. I kept telling you, but you women don't want to listen. It was clear to Gregor that his father had put the worst interpretation on Greta's all-too-brief announcement and assumed that Gregor was guilty of some outrage. Therefore, Gregor now had to try to calm his father down, since he had neither the time nor the ability to enlighten him. And so, he fled to the door of his room and pressed himself against it, for his father to see, as soon as he came into the foyer, that Gregor had the best intentions of returning to his room immediately, and that it was not necessary to drive him back. If only the door opened for him, he would disappear at once. But his father was in no mood to notice such subtleties. Ah! He cried as he entered, in a tone that sounded as if he were at once furious and glad. Gregor turned his head away from the door and lifted it toward his father. He had not really imagined his father looking like this, as he stood in front of him now, 
Admittedly, Gregor had been too absorbed recently in his newfangled crawling to bother as much as before about events in the rest of the house and should really have been prepared to find some changes. And yet, and yet, was this still his father? Was it the same man who in the old days used to lie wearily buried in bed when Gregor left on a business trip, who greeted him on his return in the evening, sitting in his bathrobe in the armchair, who actually had difficulty in getting to his feet, but as a sign of joy only lifted up his arms, and who, on the rare occasions when the whole family went out for a walk, on a few Sundays in June and on the major holidays, used to shuffle along with great effort between Gregor and his mother, who were slow walkers themselves, always a little more slowly than they, wrapped in his old overcoat, always carefully planting down his crutch-handled cane, and when he wanted to say something, nearly always stood still and assembled his escort around him. Now, however, he was holding himself very erect, dressed in a tight-fitting blue uniform with gold buttons, the kind worn by messengers at banking concerns. Above the high, stiff collar of the jacket, his heavy chin protruded. Under his bushy eyebrows, his black eyes darted bright, piercing glances. His usually rumpled white hair was combed flat, with a scrupulously exact, gleaming part. He threw his cap, which was adorned with a gold monogram, probably that of a bank, in an arc across the entire room onto the couch, and with the tails of his long uniform jacket slapped back, his hands in his pants pockets went for Gregor with a sullen look on his face. He probably did not know himself what he had in mind. Still, he lifted his feet unusually high off the floor, and Gregor staggered at the gigantic size of the soles of his boots. But he did not linger over this. He had known right from the first day of his new life that his father considered only the strictest treatment called for in dealing with him. And so he ran ahead of his father, stopped when his father stood still, and scooted ahead again when his father made even the slightest movement. In this way they made more than one tour of the room without anything decisive happening. In fact, the whole movement did not even have the appearance of a chase because of its slow tempo. So Gregor kept to the floor for the time being, especially since he was afraid that his father might intercept a flight onto the walls or the ceiling as a piece of particular nastiness. Of course, Gregor had to admit that he would not be able to keep up even this running for long, for whenever his father took one step, Gregor had to execute countless movements. He was already beginning to feel winded, just as in the old days he had not had very reliable lungs. As he now staggered around, hardly keeping his eyes open in order to gather all his strength for the running, in his obtuseness not thinking of any escape other than by running, and having almost forgotten that the walls were at his disposal, though here, of course, they were blocked up with elaborately carved furniture full of notches and points. At that moment, a lightly flung object hit the floor right near him and rolled in front of him. It was an apple. A second one came flying right after it. Gregor stopped dead with fear. Further running was useless, for his father was determined to bombard him. He had filled his pockets from the fruit bowl on the buffet and was now pitching one apple after another for the time being without taking good aim. These little red apples rolled around on the floor as if electrified, clicking into each other. One apple, thrown weakly, grazed Gregor's back and slid off harmlessly, but the very next one that came flying after it literally forced its way into Gregor's back. Gregor tried to drag himself away, as if the startling, unbelievable pain might disappear with the change of pace, but he felt nailed to the spot and stretched out his body in a complete confusion of all his senses. With his last glance, he saw the door of his room burst open as his mother rushed out ahead of his screaming sister in her chemise, for his sister had partly undressed her while she was unconscious in order to let her breathe more freely. Saw his mother run up to his father, and on the way her unfastened petticoats slide to the floor one by one, and saw as, stumbling over the skirts, she forced herself onto his father and embracing him in complete union with him. But now Gregor's sight went dim, her hands clasping his father's neck, begged, for Gregor's life. Chapter 3 Gregor's serious wound, from which he suffered for over a month, the apple, remained embedded in his flesh as a visible souvenir since no one dared to remove it, seemed to have reminded even his father that Gregor was a member of the family, in spite of his present pathetic and repulsive shape, who could not be treated as an enemy, that, on the contrary, it was the commandment of the family duty to swallow their disgust and endure him, endure him in nothing more. And now, 
although Gregory had lost some of his mobility, and probably for good because of his wound, and although for the time being he needed long, long minutes to get across his room, like an old war veteran, crawling above ground was out of the question. For this deterioration of his situation, he was granted compensation, which in his view was entirely satisfactory. Every day, around dusk, the living room door, which he was in the habit of watching closely for an hour or two beforehand, was opened, so that, lying in the darkness of his room, invisible from the living room, he could see the whole family, sitting at the table under the lamp, and could listen to their conversation, as it were, with general permission, and so it was completely different from before. Of course, these were no longer the animated conversations of the old days, which Gregory used to remember with a certain nostalgia in small hotel rooms when he'd had to throw himself wearily into the damp bedding. Now things were mostly very quiet. Soon after supper, his father would fall asleep in his armchair. His mother and sister would caution each other to be quiet. His mother bent low under the light, so delicate lingerie for a clothing store. His sister, who had taken a job as a salesgirl, was learning shorthand and French in the evenings in order to attain a better position sometime in the future. Sometimes his father woke up, and as if he had absolutely no idea that he had been asleep, said to his mother, Look how long you're sewing again today and went right back to sleep, while mother and sister smiled wearily at each other. With a kind of perverse obstinacy, his father refused to take off his official uniform, even in the house, and while his robe hung uselessly on the clothes hook, his father dozed, completely dressed, in his chair, as if he were always ready for duty, and were waiting even here for the voice of his superior. As a result, his uniform, which had not been new to start with, began to get dirty in spite of all the mother's and sister's care, and Gregor would often stare all evening long at this garment, covered with stains and gleaming with its constantly polished gold buttons, in which the old man slept most uncomfortably and yet peacefully. As soon as the clock struck ten, his mother tried to awaken his father with soft, encouraging words, and then persuade him to go to bed, for this was no place to sleep properly, and his father badly needed his sleep, since he had to be at work at six o'clock. But with the obstinacy that had possessed him ever since he had become a messenger, he always insisted on staying at the table a little longer, although he invariably fell asleep, and then could be persuaded only with the greatest effort to exchange his armchair for bed. However much mother and sister might pounce on him with little admonitions, he would slowly shake his head for a quarter of an hour at a time, keeping his eyes closed and would not get up. Gregor's mother plucked him by the sleeves, whispered blandishments into his ear, his sister dropped her homework in order to help her mother, but all this was of no use. He only sank deeper into his armchair. Not until the women lifted him up under his arms did he open his eyes, look alternately at mother and sister, and usually say, Oh, what a life. So this is the peace of my old age. And leaning on the two women, he would get up laboriously, as if he were the greatest weight on himself and let the women lead him to the door, where, shrugging them off, he would proceed independently, while Gregor's mother threw down her sewing and his sister her pen as quickly as possible so as to run after his father and be of further assistance. Who in this overworked and exhausted family had time to worry about Gregor any more than was absolutely necessary? The household was stinted more and more. Now the maid was let go after all. A gigantic, bony cleaning woman with white hair fluttering about her head came mornings and evenings to do the heaviest work. His mother took care of everything else, along with all her sewing. It even happened that various pieces of family jewelry, which in the old days his mother and sister had been overjoyed to wear at parties and celebrations, were sold, as Gregor found out one evening from the general discussion of the prices they had fetched. But the biggest complaint was always that they could not give up the apartment, which was much too big for their present needs, since no one could figure out how Gregor was supposed to be moved. But Gregor understood easily that it was not only consideration for him which prevented their moving, for he could easily have been transported in a suitable crate with a few air holes. What mainly prevented the family from moving was their complete hopelessness, and the thought that they had been struck by a misfortune as none of their relatives and acquaintances had ever been hit. What the world demands of poor people, they did to the utmost of their ability, his father brought breakfast for the minor officials at the bank. His mother sacrificed herself to the underwear of strangers. His sister ran back and forth behind the counter at the request of the customers. But for anything more than this, 
they did not have strength, and the wound in Gregor's back began to hurt anew when mother and sister, after getting his father to bed, now came back, dropped their work, pulled their chairs close to each other, and sat cheek to cheek when his mother, pointing to Gregor's room, said, Close that door, Greta. And when Gregor was back in the darkness, while in the other room the women mingled their tears or stared dry-eyed at the table. Gregor spent the days and nights almost entirely without sleep. Sometimes he thought the next time the door opened he would take charge of the family's affairs again, just as he had done in the old days. After this long while, there appeared again in his thoughts the boss and the manager, the salesman and the trainees, the handyman who was so dense, two or three friends from other firms, a chambermaid in a provincial hotel, a happy fleeting memory, a cashier in a millinery store, whom he had courted earnestly but too slowly. They all appeared intermingled with strangers or people he had already forgotten, but instead of helping him and his family, they were all inaccessible, and he was glad when they faded away. At other times, he was in no mood to worry about his family. He was completely filled with rage at his miserable treatment, and although he could not imagine anything that would pique his appetite, he still made plans for getting into the pantry to take what was coming to him, even if he wasn't hungry. No longer considering what she could do to give Gregor a special treat, his sister, before running to do business every morning and afternoon, hurriedly shoved any old food into Gregor's room with her foot, and in the evening, regardless of whether the food had only been toyed with or, in most usual case, had been left completely untouched, she swept it out with a swish of the broom. The cleaning up of Gregor's room, which she now always did in the evenings, cannot be done more hastily. Streaks of dirt ran along the walls, fluffs of dust and filth lay here and there on the floor. At first, whenever his sister came in, Gregor would place himself in those corners which were particularly offending, meaning by his position and a sense of reproach for her. But he could probably have stayed there for weeks without his sisters showing any improvement. She must have seen the dirt as clearly as he did, but she had just decided to leave it. At the same time, she made sure, with an irritableness that was completely new to her, and which had in fact infected the whole family, that the cleaning of Gregor's room remained her province. One time, his mother had submitted Gregor's room to a major house cleaning, which she managed only after employing a couple pails of water. All this dampness, of course, irritated Gregor too, and he lay prostrate, sour and immobile on the couch. But his mother's punishment was not long in coming, for hardly had his sister noticed the difference in Gregor's room that evening. Then, deeply insulted, she ran into the living room, and in spite of her mother's imploringly uplifted hands, burst out in a fit of crying, which his parents... His father had naturally been startled out of his armchair, at first watched in helpless amazement until they too got going. Turning to the right, his father blamed his mother for not letting his sister clean Gregor's room, but turning to the left, he screamed at his sister that she would never again be allowed to clean Gregor's room, while his mother tried to drag his father, who was out of his mind with excitement, into the bedroom. His sister, shaken with sobs, hammered the table with her small fists, and Gregor hissed loudly with rage because it did not occur to any of them to close the door and spare him such a scene and a row. But even if his sister, exhausted from her work at the store, had gotten fed up with taking care of Gregor as she used to, it was not necessary at all for his mother to take her place, and still Gregor did not have to be neglected, for now the cleaning woman was there. This old widow, who, thanks to her strong, bony frame, had probably survived the worst in a long life, was not really repelled by Gregor. Without being in the least inquisitive, she had once accidentally opened the door of Gregor's room, and at the sight of Gregor, who, completely taken by surprise, began to race back and forth, although no one was chasing him, she had remained standing, with her hands folded on her stomach, marveling. From that time on, she never failed to open the door a crack every morning and every evening, and peek in hurriedly at Gregor. In the beginning, she also used to call him over to her with words she probably considered friendly, like, Come over here for a minute, you old dung beetle, or Look at that old dung beetle. To forms of address like these, Gregor would not respond, but remained immobile where he was, as if the door had not been opened. If only they had given this cleaning woman orders to clean up his room every day, instead of letting her disturb him uselessly whenever the mood took her. Once, early in the morning, heavy rain, perhaps, already a sign of approaching spring, was beating at the window panes. Gregor was so exasperated when the cleaning woman started in again with her phrases that he turned on her. 
of course slowly and decrepitly, as if to attack. But the cleaning woman, instead of getting frightened, simply lifted up high a chair near the door, and as she stood there with her mouth wide open, her intention was clearly to shut her mouth only when the chair in her hand came crashing down on Gregor's back. So is that all there is? she asked, when Gregor turned around again, and she quietly put the chair back in the corner. Gregor now hardly ate anything any more. Only when he accidentally passed the food laid out for him would he take a bite into his mouth just for fun, hold it in for hours, and then mostly spit it out again. At first he thought that his grief at the state of his room kept him off food, but it was the very changes in his room to which he quickly became adjusted. His family had gotten into the habit of putting in this room things for which they could not find any other place, and now there were plenty of these, since one of the rooms in the apartment had been rented to three boarders. These serious gentlemen, all three had long beards, as Gregor was able to register once through a crack in the door, were obsessed with neatness, not only in their room, but since they had, after all, moved in here, throughout the entire household, and especially in the kitchen. They could not stand useless, let alone dirty junk. Besides, they had brought along most of their own household goods. For this reason, many things had become superfluous, and though they certainly weren't salable, on the other hand, they could not just be thrown out. All these things migrated into Gregor's room. Likewise, the ash can and the garbage can from the kitchen. Whatever was not being used at the moment was just flung into Gregor's room by the cleaning woman, who was always in a big hurry. Fortunately, Gregor generally saw only the object involved in the hand that held it. Maybe the cleaning woman intended to reclaim the things as soon as she had a chance or else to throw out everything altogether in one fell swoop, but in fact they would have remained lying wherever they had been thrown in the first place if Gregor had not squeezed through the junk and set it in motion, at first from necessity, because otherwise there would have been no room to crawl in, but later with growing pleasure, although after such excursions, tired to death and sad, he did not budge again for hours. Since the rumors sometimes also had their supper at home in the common living room, the living room door remained closed on certain evenings. But Gregor found it very easy to give up the open door, for on many evenings when it was opened, he had not taken advantage of it, but instead, without the family's noticing, had lain in the darkest corner of his room. But once, the cleaning woman had left the living room door slightly open, and it also remained open a little when the rumors came in in the evening and the lamp was lit. They sat down at the head of the table, where in the old days his father, his mother, and Gregor had eaten, unfolded their napkins, and picked up their knives and forks. At once his mother appeared in the doorway with a platter of meat, and just behind her came his sister with the platter piled high with potatoes. A thick vapor steamed up from the food. The rumors bent over the platter set in front of them as if to examine them before eating, and in fact the one who sat in the middle and who seemed to be regarded by the other two as an authority cut into a piece of meat while it was still on the platter, evidently to find out whether it was tender enough or whether it should perhaps be sent back to the kitchen. He was satisfied, and mother and sister, who had been watching anxiously, sighed with relief and began to smile. The family itself ate in the kitchen. Nevertheless, before going into the kitchen, his father came into this room and, bowing once, cap in hand, made a turn around the table. The rumors rose as one man and mumbled something into their beards. When they were alone again, they ate in almost complete silence. It seemed strange to Gregor that among all the different noises of eating, he kept picking up the sound of their chewing teeth, as if this were a sign to Gregor that you needed teeth to eat with, and that, even with the best make of toothless jaws, you couldn't do a thing. I'm hungry enough, Gregor said to himself, full of grief, but not for these things. Look how these rumors are gorging themselves, and I'm dying. On this same evening, Gregor could not remember having heard the violin during the whole time. The sound of violin playing came from the kitchen. The rumors had already finished their evening meal. The one in the middle had taken out a newspaper, given each one of the two others a page, and now, leaning back, they read and smoked. When the violin began to play, they became attentive, got up, and went on tiptoe to the door leading to the foyer, where they stood in a huddle. They must have been heard in the kitchen, for his father called... Perhaps the playing bothers you, gentlemen. It can be stopped right away. On the contrary, said the middle rumor. Wouldn't the young lady like to come in to us and play in here, where it's much roomier and more comfortable? Oh, certainly, called Gregor's father, as if he were the violinist. The boarders went back into the room and waited. 
Soon, Gregor's father came in with the music stand, his mother with the sheet music, and his sister with the violin. Calmly, his sister got everything ready for playing. His parents, who had never rented out rooms before and therefore behaved toward the rumors with excessive politeness, did not even dare sit down on their own chairs. His father leaned against the door, his right hand inserted between two buttons of his uniform coat, which he kept closed. But his mother was offered a chair by one of the rumors, and since she left the chair where the rumor just happened to put it, she sat in a corner to one side. His sister began to play. Father and mother, from either side, attentively followed the movements of her hands. Attracted by the playing, Gregor had dared to come out a little further and already had his head in the living room. It hardly surprised him that lately he was showing so little consideration for the others. Once such consideration had been his greatest pride, and yet he would never have had better reason to keep hidden, for now, because of the dust which lay all over his room and blew around at the slightest movement, he too was completely covered with dust. He dragged around with him on his back and along his sides fluff and hairs and scraps of food. His indifference to everything was much too deep for him to have gotten on his back and scrubbed himself clean against the carpet, as once he had done several times a day. And in spite of his state, he was not ashamed to inch out a little further on the immaculate living room floor. Admittedly, no one paid any attention to him. The family was completely absorbed by the violin playing. The rumors, on the other hand, who at first had stationed themselves hand in pockets, much too close behind his sister's music stand so that they could all have followed the score, which certainly must have upset his sister, soon withdrew to the window, talking to each other in an undertone. Their heads lowered, where they remained anxiously watched by his father. It now seemed only too obvious that they were disappointed in their expectation of hearing beautiful or entertaining violin playing, had had enough of the whole performance, and continued to let their peace be disturbed only out of politeness. Especially the way they all blew the cigar smoke out of their nose and mouth toward the ceiling suggested great nervousness. And yet his sister was playing so beautifully. Her face was inclined to one side, sadly and probingly. Her eyes followed the lines of music. Gregor crawled forward a little farther, holding his head close to the floor so that it might be possible to catch her eye. Was he an animal that music could move him so? He felt as if the way to the unknown nourishment he longed for were coming to the light. He was determined to force himself on until he reached his sister, to pluck at her skirt, and to let her know in this way that she should bring her violin into his room, for no one here appreciated her playing the way he would appreciate it. He would never again let her out of his room, at least not for as long as he lived. For once, his nightmarish looks would be of use to him. He would be at all the doors of his room at the same time and hiss and spit at the aggressors. His sister, however, should not be forced to stay with him, but would do so out of her own free will. She should sit next to him on the couch, bending her ear down to him, and then he would confide to her that he had the firm intention of sending her to the conservatory and that, if the catastrophe had not intervened, he would have announced this to everyone last Christmas. Certainly, Christmas had come and gone, without taking notice of any objections. After this declaration, his sister would burst into tears of emotion, and Gregor would raise himself up to her shoulder and kiss her on the neck, which, ever since she started going out to work, she kept bare, without a ribbon or a collar. Mr. Samsa, the middle rumor called to Gregor's father, and without wasting another word, pointed his index finger at Gregor, who was slowly moving forward. The violin stopped. The middle rumor smiled first at his friends, shaking his head, and then looked at Gregor again. Rather than driving Gregor out, his father seemed to consider it more urgent to start by soothing the rumors, although they were not at all upset. And Gregor seemed to be entertaining them more than the violin playing. He rushed over to them and tried with outstretched arms to drive them into their room and, and at the same time with his body to block their view of Gregor. Now they actually did get a little angry. It was not clear whether because of his father's behavior or because of their dawning realization of having had, without knowing it, such a next-door neighbor as Gregor. They demanded explanations from his father, and in their turn they raised their arms, plucked excitedly at their beards, and dragging their feet backed off toward their room. In the meantime, his sister had overcome the abstracted mood into which she had fallen after her playing had been so suddenly interrupted, and all at once, after holding violin and bow for a while in her slackly hanging hands and continuing to follow the scores if she were still playing, she pulled herself together. 
laid the instrument on the lap of her mother, who was still sitting in her chair, fighting for breath, her lungs violently heaving, and ran into the next room, which the rumors, under pressure from her father, were nearing more quickly than before. One could see the covers and bolsters on the beds, obeying his sister's practiced hands, fly up and arrange themselves. Before the boarders had reached the room, she had finished turning on the beds and had slipped out. Her father seemed once again to be gripped by his perverse obstinacy to such a degree that he completely forgot any respect still due his tenants. He drove them on and kept on driving until, already at the bedroom door, the middle boarder stamped his foot thunderingly and thus brought him to a standstill. I herewith declare, he said, raising his hand and casting his eyes around for Gregor's mother and sister too, that in view of the disgusting conditions prevailing in this apartment and family, here he spat curtly and decisively on the floor, I give notice, as of now, of course I won't pay a cent for the days I have been living here either. On the contrary, I shall consider taking some sort of action against you with claims that, believe me, will be easy to substantiate. He stopped and looked straight in front of him as if he were expecting something. And in fact, his two friends at once chimed in with the words, We too give notice, as of now. Thereupon he grabbed the doorknob and slammed the door with a bang. Gregor's father, his hands groping, staggered to his armchair and collapsed into it. It looked as if he were stretching himself out for his usual evening nap, but the heavy drooping of his head, as if it had lost all support, showed that he was certainly not asleep. All this time Gregor had lain quietly at the spot where the rumors had surprised him. His disappointment at the failure of his plan, but perhaps also the weakness caused by so much fasting, made it impossible for him to move. He was afraid with some certainty that in the very next moment a general debacle would burst over him, and he waited. He was not even startled by the violin as it slipped from under his mother's trembling fingers and fell off her lap with a reverberating clang. "'My dear parents,' said his sister, and by way of an introduction pounded her hand on the table, "'things can't go on like this. Maybe you don't realize it, but I do. I won't pronounce the name of my brother in front of this monster, and so all I say is, we have to try to get rid of it. We've done everything humanly possible to take care of it and to put up with it. I don't think anyone can blame us in the least. She's absolutely right, said his father to himself. His mother, who still could not catch her breath, began to cough dully behind her hand, a wild look in her eyes. His sister rushed over to his mother and held her forehead. His father seemed to have been led by Greta's words to more definite thoughts, had sat up, was playing with the cap of his uniform among the plates, which were still lying on the table from the rumor supper, and from time to time looked at Gregor's motionless form. We must try to get rid of it, his sister now said, exclusively to her father, since her mother was coughing too hard to hear anything. It will be the death of you two. I, I can see it coming. People who already have to work as hard as we do can't put up with this constant torture at home, too. I can't stand it any more either. And she broke out crying so bitterly that her tears poured down onto her mother's face, which she wiped off with mechanical movements of her hand. Child, said her father kindly and with unusual understanding, but what can we do? Gregor's sister only shrugged her shoulders as a sign of the bewildered mood that had now gripped her as she cried, in contrast with her earlier confidence. If he could understand us, said her father, half questioning. In the midst of her crying, Gregor's sister waved her hand violently as a sign that that was out of the question. If he could understand us, his father repeated, and by closing his eyes, absorbed his daughter's conviction of the impossibility of the idea, then maybe we could come to an agreement with him. But the way things are... It has to go, cried his sister. That's the only answer, father. You just have to try to get rid of the idea that it's Gregor. Believing it for so long, that is our real misfortune. But how can it be Gregor? If it were Gregor, he would have realized long ago that it isn't possible for human beings to live with such a creature, and he would have gone away of his own free will. Then we wouldn't have a brother, but we'd be able to go on living and honor his memory. But as things are, this animal persecutes us, drives the rumors away, obviously wants to occupy the whole apartment, and for us to sleep in the gutter. Look, father, she suddenly shrieked, he's starting in again. 
and in a fit of terror that was completely incomprehensible to Gregor, his sister abandoned even her mother, literally shoved herself off from the chair as if she would rather sacrifice her mother than stay near Gregor, and rushed behind her father, who, upset only by her behavior, also stood up and half-lifted his arms in front of her, as if to protect her. But Gregor had absolutely no intention of frightening anyone, let alone his sister. He had only begun to turn around in order to trek back into his room. Certainly, his movements did look peculiar, since his ailing condition made him help the complicated turning maneuver along with his head, which he lifted up many times and knocked against the floor. He stopped and looked around. His good intentions seemed to have been recognized. It had only been a momentary scare. Now they all watched him, silent and sad. His mother lay in her armchair, her legs stretched out and pressed together, her eyes almost closing from exhaustion. His father and his sister sat side by side. His sister had put her arm around her father's neck. Now maybe they'll let me turn around, Gregor thought, and began his labors again. He could not repress his panting from the exertion, and from time to time he had to rest. Otherwise no one harassed him. He was left completely on his own. When he had completed the turn, he immediately began to crawl back in a straight line. He was astounded at the great distance separating him from his room and could not understand at all how, given his weakness, he had covered the same distance in a little while ago, almost without realizing it. Constantly intent only on rapid crawling, he hardly noticed that not a word, not an exclamation from his family interrupted him. Only when he was already in the doorway did he turn his head, not completely, for he felt his neck stiffening. Nevertheless, he still saw that behind him nothing had changed except that his sister had gotten up. His last glance ranged over his mother, who was now fast asleep. He was hardly inside his room when the door was hurriedly slammed shut, firmly bolted, and locked. Gregor was so frightened at the sudden noise behind him that his little legs gave way under him. It was his sister who had been in such a hurry. She had been standing up straight, ready, and waiting. Then she had leaped forward, nimbly. Gregor had not even heard her coming, and she cried, Finally! to her parents as she turned the key in the lock. And now, Gregor asked himself, looking around in the darkness. He soon made the discovery that he could no longer move at all. It did not surprise him. Rather, it seemed unnatural that until now he had actually been able to propel himself on these thin little legs. Otherwise, he felt relatively comfortable. He had pains, of course, throughout his whole body, but it seemed to him that they were gradually getting fainter and fainter and would finally go away altogether. The rotten apple in his back and the inflamed area around it, which were completely covered with fluffy dust, already hardly bothered him. He thought back on his family with deep emotion and love. His conviction that he would have to disappear was, if possible, even firmer than his sister's. He remained in this state of empty and peaceful reflection until the tower clock struck three in the morning. He still saw that outside the window everything was beginning to grow light. Then, without his consent, his head sank down to the floor, and from his nostrils streamed his last weak breath. When, early in the morning, the cleaning woman came, in sheer energy and impatience she would slam all the doors so hard, although she had often been asked not to, that once she arrived, quiet sleep was no longer possible anywhere in the apartment, she did not at first find anything out of the ordinary on paying Gregor her usual short visit. She thought that he was deliberately lying motionless, pretending that his feelings were hurt. She credited him with unlimited intelligence. Because she happened to be holding the long broom, she tried from the doorway to tickle Gregor with it. When this too produced no results, she became annoyed and jabbed Gregor a little, and only when she had shoved him without any resistance to another spot did she begin to take notice. When she quickly became aware of the true state of things, she opened her eyes wide, whistled softly, but did not dawdle. Instead, she tore open the door of the bedroom and shouted at the top of her voice into the darkness, Come and have a look. It's croaked. It's lying there. That is a doornail. The couple, Mr. and Mrs. Samsa, sat up in their marriage bed and had a struggle overcoming their shock at the cleaning woman before they could finally grasp her message. But then Mr. and Mrs. Samsa hastily scrambled out of bed, each on his side. Mr. Samsa threw the blanket around his shoulders. Mrs. Samsa came out in nothing but her nightgown. Dressed this way, they entered Gregor's room. In the meantime, the door of the living room had also opened, where Greta had been sleeping since the rumors had moved in. She was fully dressed, as if she had not been asleep at all, and her pale face seemed to confirm this. Dead? Dead? 
said Mrs. Sampsa, and looked inquiringly at the cleaning woman, although she could scrutinize everything for herself and could recognize the truth, even without scrutiny. I'll say, said the cleaning woman, and to prove it, she pushed Gregor's corpse with her broom a good distance sideways. Mrs. Sampsa made a movement as if to hold the broom back, but did not do it. Well, said Mr. Sampsa, now we can thank God. He crossed himself, and the three women followed his example. Greta, who never took her eyes off the corpse, said, Just look how thin he was. Of course, he didn't need anything for such a long time. The food came out again, just the way it went in. As a matter of fact, Gregor's body was completely flat and dry. This was obvious now for the first time, really, since the body was no longer raised up by his little legs and nothing else distracted the eye. Come in with us for a little while, Greta, said Mrs. Sampsa with a melancholy smile, and Greta, not without looking back at the corpse, followed her parents into their bedroom. The cleaning woman shut the door and opened the window wide. Although it was early in the morning, there was already some mildness mixed in with the fresh air. After all, it was already the end of March. The three boarders came out of their room and looked around in astonishment for their breakfast. They had been forgotten. Where's breakfast? The middle rumor grumpily asked the cleaning woman, but she put her finger to her lips and then hastily and silently beckoned the boarders to follow her into Gregor's room. They came willingly and then stood, their hands in the pockets of their somewhat shabby jackets, in the now already very bright room surrounding Gregor's corpse. At that point the bedroom door opened, and Mr. Samsa appeared in his uniform, his wife on one arm, his daughter on the other. They all looked as if they had been crying. From time to time, Greta pressed her face against her father's sleeve. "'Leave my house immediately,' said Mr. Sampsa, and pointed to the door without letting go of the women. "'What do you mean by that?' said the middle rumor, somewhat nonplussed, and smiled with a sugary smile. The two others held their hands behind their back and incessantly rubbed them together as if in joyful anticipation of a big argument, which could only turn out in their favor." I mean just what I say, answered Mr. Sampsa, and with his two companions marched in a straight line toward the rumor. At first the rumor stood still and looked at the floor as if the thoughts inside his head were fitting themselves together in a new order. So we'll go then, he said, and looked up at Mr. Sampsa, as if suddenly overcome by a fit of humility, he were asking for further permission, even for this decision. Mr. Sampsa merely nodded briefly several times, his eyes wide open. Thereupon the rumor actually went immediately into the foyer, taking long strides. His two friends had already been listening for a while, their hands completely still, and now they went hopping right after him as if afraid that Mr. Samsa might get into the foyer ahead of them and interrupt the contact with their leader. In the foyer, all three took their hats from the coat rack, pulled their canes from the umbrella stand, bowed silently, and left the apartment. In a suspicious mood, which proved completely unfounded, Mr. Samsa led the two women out onto the landing, leaning over the banister. They watched the three rumors slowly but steadily going down the long flight of stairs, disappearing on each landing at a particular turn of the stairway, and a few moments later emerging again. The farther down they got, the more the Samsa family's interest in them wore off. And when a butcher's boy with a carrier on his head came climbing up the stairs with a proud bearing toward them and then up on past them, Mr. Samsa and the women quickly left the banister and all went back as if relieved, into their apartment. <coughs> they decided to spend this day resting and going for a walk. They not only deserved a break in their work, they absolutely needed one, and so they sat down at the table and wrote three letters of excuse. Mr. Samsa to the management of the bank, Mrs. Samsa to her employer, and Greta to the store owner. While they were writing, the cleaning woman came in to say that she was going since her morning's work was done. The three letter writers at first simply nodded without looking up, but as the cleaning women still kept lingering, they looked up, annoyed. Well, asked Mr. Sampsa. The cleaning woman stood smiling in the doorway as if she had some great news to announce to the family, but would do so only if she were thoroughly questioned. The little ostrich feather which stood almost upright on her hat and which had irritated Mr. Sampsa the whole time she had been with them swayed lightly in all directions. What do you want? asked Mrs. Sampsa, who inspired the most respect in the cleaning woman. Well, the cleaning woman answered, and for good-natured laughter could not immediately go on, look, you don't have to worry about getting rid of the stuff next door. 
It's already been taken care of. Mrs. Samsa and Greta bent down over their letters as if to continue writing. Mr. Samsa, who noticed that the cleaning woman was now about to start describing everything in detail, stopped her with a firmly outstretched hand. But since she was not going to be permitted to tell her story, she remembered that she was in a great hurry, cried, obviously insulted, so long everyone, whirled around wildly and left the apartment with a terrible slamming of doors. We'll fire her tonight, said Mr. Samsa, but did not get an answer from either his wife or his daughter, for the cleaning woman seemed to have ruined their barely regained peace of mind. They got up, went to the window, and stayed there, holding each other tight. Mr. Samsa turned around in his chair toward them and watched them quietly for a while. Then he called, Come on now, come over here. Stop brooding over the past and have a little consideration for me too. The women obeyed him at once, hurried over to him, fondled him, and quickly finished their letters. Then all three of them left the apartment together, something they had not done in months, and took the trolley into the open country on the outskirts of the city. The car in which they were the only passengers was completely filled with warm sunshine. Leaning back comfortably in their seats, they discussed their prospects for the time to come, and it seemed on closer examination that these weren't bad at all. For all three positions, about which they had never really asked one another in any detail, were exceedingly advantageous and especially promising for the future. The greatest immediate improvement in their situation would come easily, of course, from a change in apartments. They would now take a smaller and cheaper apartment, but one better situated and in every way simpler to manage than the old one which Gregor had picked for them. While they were talking in this vein, it occurred almost simultaneously to Mr. and Mrs. Samsa, as they watched their daughter getting livelier and livelier, that lately, in spite of all the troubles which had turned her cheeks pale, she had blossomed into a good-looking, shapely girl. Growing quieter and communicating almost unconsciously through glances, they thought that it would soon be time, too, to find her a good husband. And it was like a confirmation of their new dreams and good intentions, when at the end of the ride, their daughter got up first and stretched her young body.